obviously, two weeks ago, we talked for a little bit about um, Hurricane Helene that was, uh, at the time, seeming like it would bear down on the um, residents of Western Florida and then head on into the Carolinas and elsewhere, which it did. Um, And now we have another uh, event. And so um, one of the things that this provides us an opportunity to talk about is the fact that a lot of times what we're seeing more and more of these days is not a management challenge or a management crisis, but a thing on top of a thing on top of a thing on top of a thing. So so we've had this ourselves um, in the past. The most high profile one would be when we had the borderline shooting, that horrible gun violence incident um, in Thousand Oaks. And then 12 hours later, the Woolsey fire started. And we had this big, massive fire that people had to evacuate from and deal with all that. And so that is, um, as I mentioned, is, is unfortunately uh, becoming more common, and that's what appears to be going on right now with our our friends on the East Coast, unfortunately. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. So let's, by way of uh, review, one of the things we're we're talking about in our class is you know the specific case studies, the specific um, uh, issue before us, and this and that. But then also, sort of more holistically, has stuff become too complex for us to effectively manage? Um, and so that's something that you're going to have to tell me about. You're going to have to um, uh, uh, brainstorm and, and come up with, with what you feel is an um, answer to that. But I think this is, this is uh, one, ex- uh, so today is, is a good example of um, sort of kind of delving into some dimensions of that in, in the case of our uh, colleagues back east. So as we mentioned, uh, this was Helene when she was uh, approaching um, Florida, um, and we we spent some time uh, a couple weeks ago talking about effective communication. We talked about how we can visualize stuff, and in this case, we were talking about um, how much uh, different from the background the current waters in that part of the Gulf of Mexico um, were at the time, and they remain. And so this is, uh, you know, really um, helping to fuel these types of events. And we, then we looked at the sea surface temperature as well. Uh, 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 infrared, we talked a little about modeling with the different spaghetti models. In this case, this was an example of what we might have, what you and I might have as technical folks that are looking at the different predictions in terms of uh, model X, what it might produce, model Y, what it might produce in terms of the coming hours uh, in terms of storm intensity. And then we talked about how you might translate that into a little bit easier uh, visualization, for example, for um, uh, members of the public that, 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 are, that don't need to see all, the, all that spaghetti stuff. Um, again, the spaghetti models. And then we uh, talked about some of the basic products from uh, the National Hurricane Center, um, which, is, uh, which ha- the, these products have undergone lots of revision. They're still being revised all the time to figure out the best ways to communicate to folks and, and ex- express to them the, the risk of what was going on. And as we mentioned before, this is this, is this um, uh, cone model, and this, in this white area, as visualized here, is the probable path of this, the eye of the storm. So this is not the storm width, or, or if you're outside of the white, you're not, you're not necessarily safe, um, but just to sort of help people understand. And then the, um, the lettering inside refers to the type of storm. So M for major hurricane, H for hurricane, a D for tropical depression. And then overlaid on this one was storm surge. And so we, we, we talked some t- a little bit about storm surge. And we're seeing that um, where sort of in the sort of middle part of the state here, middle of the West Coast, they really bore the brunt of it. Um, the one thing I didn't mention uh, that I probably should have is... Um, and this particularly has to do with uh, interpreting how much at risk you are or whatever, a lot of people sort of have the impression that the worst part is right in the dead center of the hurricane's path where the so-called eye goes over you. And that, that's a, you know, bad place to be. Don't, don't get me wrong. But oftentimes we see some of the largest damage um, on the so-called dirty side of the storm. And so that's because of the way these cyclonic, so in the Northern Hemisphere, 
our hurricanes spin counterclockwise. And so what that's going to mean is, is right here, let's say, let's just pick a point where um, the leftmost part of this red storm surge area. So let's imagine we're, a, we're a, a, the, the wind and we're starting there. We're not start there, but let's just, let's, we'll start marking it there. As we go, we're going to spin all the way around in this circular fashion. So that whole time we're picking up, we have a lot of fetch. We have a lot of wind moving against the liquid of the water. And it's shoving up the water, it's shoving up the water, it's shoving up the water. So we have the, the strongest storm surge, the biggest sort of chunks of water being pushed inland just to the east of the storm as it goes in. So the sort of east and, and sort of northeast is usually the worst part. So um, even though it might look like you might have dodged something, actually uh, you might be getting uh, the worst of it depending on, on the system and all this and that. Okay, so this was, this was the prediction. Uh, and so... So the storm was coming basically from near the Yucatan and essentially going straight up, more or less, the Gulf of Mexico and, and slapping into Florida. Um, as we'd mentioned, the biggest concern was storm surge um, when, it was being, when people were being warned about it. And um, in particular, folks in the coastal areas were being warned to get away. That was hugely problematic. And we know now from the after effects that that was a huge problem, but also all the rain in farther inland in the Carolinas and stuff. And, and that, that rainfall, just that aggregate amount of rainfall has been hugely problematic and washed out all kinds of infrastructure and, and, and flooded folks as well. But for the immediate strike, it was definitely the storm surge that was the big worry. And as a reminder, uh, up to 15 feet of storm surge was predicted. Uh, 15 to 20 feet, I think they, they got more like 16, 17 in most of the areas. So this is what she looked like when she came over. So, um, so pretty much followed that path. So that's good news. Um, uh, don't hear about it so much these days, but um, it is funny how, so do you guys think, you guys tell me, so when you look at the weather, do you think it's, you know, the forecast for whatever, it's Friday and you're gonna do something on Saturday and you look at the weather forecast, are you, are you pretty much happy with it or what are you thinking what, on a generic Friday, let's say? Prediction. Are you, are, you, are you happy with the information they give you? Sufficient. Sufficient. So if it would have been 30 years ago, most of the jokes of comedians are like how off the weather is and how, how poor the predictions are. We've gotten dramatically better with our ability to predict um, short term, not, not like three weeks out necessarily, but, but certainly for a day or two, three, four, four days out, we're pretty darn good, right? There's always some chance of being wrong. But, um, but this, this sucker pretty much followed that modeled path uh, uh, quite, quite well. And so I think that's important to say. Because um, just like <clears throat> when we hear some of these bad things about uh, seafood danger or, or risk from some particular energy source or something like that, we tend to hold on to that negative thought even when we, that gets refuted, or when we have evidence that, that contradicts that and shows that it's not a, a, a problem or wasn't a problem back then, that sort of sticks in our mind. So I think it's important to say that um, the resources that, that people have poured in from around the world, but especially uh, uh, here in this country, NOAA and the National Weather Service um, have made huge strides in, in forecasting, in, in making products that are more uh, usable, et cetera. And so that, that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing it follow the predictive path. Um, and then this is what was going on. The other big part of it was the um, uh, rainfall. And so we're looking at satellite data here about precipitation um, from uh, you know a week, a week and a half or so ago. Um, and we're looking at the track as it comes on. And then, and then we're, the, the storm track is overlaid here. And this is how strong the storm is. In this case, the numbers are the category, what, what, what uh, category uh, strength wind it is. So it was about a category four when it made landfall. And then once you leave the water, the hot water, the, the fuel for the storm begins to dissipate and it rapidly um, ceases. Uh, it doesn't stop being a hurricane that that minute, but it very quickly decays into um, just a really bad storm. And then we see the really intense rainfall in this case at this, at, at this um, 
freeze frame uh, just as it's hitting the Carolinas and it's about to hit uh, uh, Tennessee and, and those areas. Okay, so what happened from that event? Um, so we're, we're, we still don't know. It'll be some time before we know, and it's important. I know this isn't my disasters class, but but I'll just say uh, briefly that um, the the damage for these things is always much greater than we initially estimate, or, or or oftentimes is much greater than we initially estimate, and that's because it takes a while to to ca calculate this, and also a lot of the not obvious effects um, are hard to. Uh, calculate. So the amount of divorces, the amount of domestic abuse cases that spur out of people being stressed out because they lost their job, all that kind of stuff uh, is, is, um, needs to be accounted for. But suffice it to say, this is just the initial raw conspicuous uh, damage. And so we're somewhere around at least 213 people have, were killed in this storm. And uh, maybe as much as maybe 250 or so, perhaps. Um, there's many folks that are missing. Um, who knows what the final damage is going to be? The, the sort of quick back of the envelope estimates, because a lot of these places, especially in the Carolinas, are st people have not been able to get to them. So there's still, still um, people haven't even necessarily had a look at some of the damage in, in some of the locations. But, but so, uh, somewhere on the order of about $40 billion-ish um, for the, the immediate direct infrastructure repairs. Um, somewhere on the order of about two and a half million people were uh, without electricity, and there's still several hundreds of thousands of people without electricity, um, uh, you know, two weeks out. Um, and FEMA has assisted, now these numbers are uh, like uh, applications. So you as an individual can put an application in to this uh, federal agency that is sort of the, the gatekeeper for uh, disaster relief and, and help and stuff. Um, and so, so, you know, uh, if we were living together in a, in a, you know, in an apartment, we could put an application in to FEMA to, or we each could individually put one in. And so it's a mix as to how it goes. So, so, um, eventually there'll be clear numbers, but for right now it's on the order of about 200,000 applications have gone in. And most of that is usually for immediate relief. Like I, I lost my house. I need, I need to get uh, a hotel room or, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so that's, that's a good chunk of folks that were harmed. Um, Milton, which is coming up now, which is going to make landfall in the next uh, 24 hours or so, um, uh, was rapidly spun up and rapidly became a Category 5, which is our strongest. With the current numbering system, we're working on a new numbering system or a new, a new uh, rating system, but with our current numbering system, that's the strongest there is. So it really quickly spun up into a very intense hurricane. Um, the prediction is by the time it makes landfall, um, it, it, it will have decayed to a, a category three, which is still a major problem. That's still a real, real problem. But um, it, it is, at least last time I checked, it's not looking like it'll be a category five when it uh, makes landfall tomorrow night. The path is a little bit different. This path is going to go through, um, uh, whereas the, that last guy pretty much went north to south, this is going to go a bit more uh, east, or a bit more west to east. And so this is the path that this, uh, the, as of this morning, um, that it's being that's being predicted, where it's going to hit roughly the same place in Florida, but then rather than go up into the Carolinas, it's going to uh, blast off into the Atlantic. Um, but again, uh, storm surge still problematic, right? And because it's going to go uh, likely so <clears throat> quickly across the peninsula, it probably won't drop a huge amount of strength. And so by the time it gets to the east coast of Florida, it's going to still be, you know, pumping pretty hard. So there's going to be significant storm surge there as well. So the question is, will this have effects in New Orleans? No, I'm sure they're getting some rain from some of the outer bands, but this is probably not going to affect New Orleans. I mean, like, is it going to have the same effects as New Orleans? Like, oh, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, so I think, um, so we'll talk about some stuff next, but um, uh, this is very likely to have some very long lasting impacts uh, to these folks in Florida. Yes, I, I think so. The New Orleans situation was, um, a bit different in that um, 
if if New Orleans had just been a regular old place um, uh, and Katrina came through in 2005, it would have been bad and people would have passed away and there would have been flooding and all this and that. But then the storm would have left and the flooding would have abated. Um, instead, we built this flood protection system around New Orleans that, and that's what failed. So the story of Katrina in New Orleans was there was there was what happened outside of New Orleans and then what happened inside New Orleans. And there were really very different, um, different effects. And so what was the stuff outside in Plaquemines Parish where we work and in the rural areas of Louisiana, that was more like traditional hurricane impacts. New Orleans was a consequence of failed infrastructure design, failed oversight, failed management, and, and um and it gave folks uh, the false impression that they would be protected and they were safe when they really were not. And so, um, yeah, so, so, that, that, so this is going to be more like a, a quote-unquote regular earth, uh, earthquake, a regular hurricane in this context. But good question, good question. Um, so again, here's more of that, uh, a little more uh, formal uh, or detailed prediction. This is a little more recent than that last one. Um, and so still a lot of storm surge, not the 15 to 20 feet, the peak estimated uh, most recently is like 10 to 15. That's still a problem. Again, we mentioned that you know, most folks, or most of this land is only a few feet above sea level to start with. And so, so any amount of, of sea level is problematic. Um, and, okay, right, you guys get it. Okay, so, um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, how we, uh, conceptualize this. And so, so firstly, we, when we were in these situations, when, when we have the mountain lion attack, when we have the, the, the oil spill occur, um, there's the natural thing, which is where's, how many gallons of oil are on the water where, right? Which totally makes sense. Um, and so in this case, with uh, Hurricane Milton approaching, you're seeing a lot of stuff like on the right, which is, hey, how does, you know, hey, I know everybody just prepared for that last one, but you got to prepare again. And here's the generic way you, you know, uh, put wood over your windows and that, that type of stuff. Uh, on the lower left, we're seeing a bunch of uh, a gas that's already run out because of the existing uh, hurricane that, that uh, stressed the infrastructure. And it's maybe hard to get, uh, you know, gas uh, tanker trucks in there because maybe there's there's uh, trees still down the road, that kind of stuff. Uh, and the fact that everybody's wanting to get gas now and the fact that everybody's, some people are now trying to flee again. So they're trying to gas up their cars to get out of town kind of deal. Um, so all that amounts to uh, this particular gas station, no more gas, right? So, so you're out of luck if you're trying to get gas there. Um, uh, and then, and this is an evacuation a uh, picture from earlier or from yesterday where everybody's just sort of clogging the, the roads on the way out, trying to, trying to get away. Um, and then uh, on the left are, are the state issued evacuation orders. So the hotter the color, the more, um, the, the, the more of the area um, and the, more, the greater the urgency is to sort of get out of that uh, particular area. So these are important things and this is mostly what's in the news and this is mostly what people talk about right now, right? Because this is the time critical crisis, let's get your butt safe and let's get your pets safe and, and all that kind of jazz. But um, for us, um, there's, there's various things that we should be thinking about, right? These are the things, these are the management things that we should be working on before the crisis time, right? Before we get to the, the day before the storm. And so they include things like um, risk awareness, like how aware uh, how aware uh, is the public of these of their vulnerability, generally speaking, because that translates into how well people are going to harden their structure, how well they're going to um, have their bank, uh, banking information on a cloud so they can access it if their home floods, you know, that type of stuff. Next is awareness of the development. So the management decisions we've made, in this case, in terms of the built environment, that are going to lead to consequences. So the two most conspicuous ones would be uh, what we do in terms of what we put on the landscape or how we transform the, the, the physical uh, 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 lay of the land, as it were. 
And importantly here, uh, two key things are going to be the amount of, in the context of a, something like, like a hurricane, the amount of impervious surfaces. So it used to be palmetto forest, it used to be wetland, it used to be, you know, plants and stuff like that. And then we have put concrete over it, right? So it makes it that much harder when it does rain, that rain just can't be absorbed into the ground. It has to sort of run horizontally and then gets magnified in the channels where it runs into, et cetera, as you guys, as you guys understand. Um, and so, so there's the increasing amount of imperviousness of the surfaces. And then um, related to that also is the fragmentation, the, the, the outright destruction of ecosystems and the fragmentations of those that remain. And that also has to do with uh, loss of ability to, say, break down wind speed, loss of ability to absorb rainwater, all that stuff. Loss of ability to break up the storm surge. And then one that's maybe not appreciated, but we really need to be aware of this in terms of coastal management, is the fact that the stuff we do now is expensive, generally speaking, right? So the simplest example is just to look at your car, right? So um, a generic car we have right now that was built in the last you know, decade, let's say, even if you don't have a brand new car, your, your car, um, and compare it to a car from 20 years ago or 30 years ago, right? It's gonna be, it's still gonna move us around, so still doing the basic function, but whereas back then, you know, maybe you had a computer, maybe you had a, a, an oxygen sensor on the, on the um, engine that had some kind of computer chip sensor or whatever, but you know, a lot of that stuff was, was much more mechanical and analog. Now, everything is digital. And if you had something like an electric car, it's even more digital, right? It's even more electronic. And so, so even though it's a, it's a device that does, you know, functionally the same thing as, as that device from a few decades ago, replacing it is much more complex. Replacing it is much more expensive, right? Same with this building. So, so the, the old buildings that were here on campus were basically concrete, reinforced concrete. Almost, that's almost all they were. That was basically what they were. And then there's some pipes stuck in around. And, there, and then there were some wood beams where we put the terracotta tiles on, on uh, the roof. Essentially, that's mostly what the, the buildings from the 1930s were here. This building, which was built about a decade ago, is a modern building, right? So it's got, it's got a metal um, skeleton, it's got glass inside, it's got, uh, ir it's got uh, piping in it, it's got ductwork, it's got all this other stuff, right? So if we were to try to replace this, um, uh, it's gonna cost a lot more, say, per square foot or per, per unit area than that old building. And so that's really, really important. So, you guys need to understand this, that even if, if it just is a little bit of damage, right, to build back to our current standards is just a lot more resources, a lot more time, and in general uh, will oftentimes uh, be higher than the initial estimates of, of what the cost recovery um, would need to be. Okay, uh, then we have to add on stuff like climate change, right? So, so the key things going on here in Florida <clears throat> Most important things are going to be the, the increasing uh, uh, rate of sea level rise. Again, sea level rise, a natural thing that's always waxed and waned over the history of our planet, but we are changing that background rate. And so we're talking about not <clears throat> um, pure sea level rise, which a little bit would be going on even without us, but we're talking about the difference between what would historically be going on and what we're doing because of uh, climate change. And then... <clears throat> The main manifestation, we're, we're still not fully um, understanding all of the consequences of, um, uh, clim of, of a warming planet on our storm systems. There are some things that are becoming quite clear. One, it seems like we're seeing a greater frequency of storms on average, cy cyclonic storms. Secondly, they seem to be um, just like Milton there's always been some storms that rapidly get get strong quickly, but there seems to, it's, it seems to be becoming more common where these these typhoons or these cyclones, these hurricanes, sort of start at one level and then very very quickly within 24 hours or so, all of a sudden, just you know like like we threw fuel on the fire. And then another one that we're seeing is um, a huge amount of rainfall. Uh, we're seeing greater amounts of rainfall dumped. The volume that ultimately goes from the clouds down to the ground in these storms 
is quite high. And we're see as we're seeing with Helene in the Carolinas, a lot of the damage is coming from that, that swamping of, of things. <clears throat> Next is what's been going on with the insurance industry and what's going on with home uh, insurance in particular. We'll talk about that, but it's, it's uh, very likely, it's a, that, that's likely to be one of the biggest uh, consequences of this particular set of storms, for example. Um, and then uh, another thing that is really, is pretty new. So um, in every disaster I've worked, there's always been conspiracy theories. There's always people that are, that are like, well, did you hear about the dude that knew it was happening like the week before? You know, like the, just that kind of level of stupidness and incorrectness. Um, uh, understandable when people are super stressed. Understandable when people don't have access to all the information. Understandable, particularly when the, we're talking about vulnerable communities that have historically been marginalized and have, you know, often borne the brunt of a lot of, you know, active evil, uh, you know, over the, over the decades, it's sort of understandable where some of this stuff comes from, but it used to be the, the kind of wing nuts. It used to be the kind of weird flyer on the telephone pole that you see sometimes, right? It's becoming much more mainstream. And we're seeing that now we've seen that just in the last uh, week or so with, um, and again, it's not just some rando that lives down by the river, but it's, major um, media outlets and all kinds of stuff. So both disinformation and the last one that's related to that is this growing <clears throat> um, anti-institutionalism, this growing sense of like, oh, blah, 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 always sucks. All politicians always suck. All government always sucks. All organizations are always bad. You know, like that level of stuff. When we're in a crisis like this, that that really has very clear material consequences. If you think that everybody here is incompetent and nobody's possibly gonna help you, you're not gonna believe it when someone says, hey, you want some water? Hey, you want some food? Or hey, if you go down here, you can get, you can get some money for a hotel, right? That kind of stuff, it just gets, it gets washed out. And then those people end up um, not getting the help they, they, they should have. Okay, cool, question so far? Okay, so the first one is I want you guys to get out to, to get your device of choice. And so keeping on this theme, let's look at some of these things in more detail. So what I want you guys to do is I want you to do a flood search flood map in Pineless County. That's the county that um, uh, Tampa is in. So that's the county that's basically, that's the county that's basically right around here, kind of in this, uh, in this uh, purpley uh, area here. So, so with the idea of where were we pre-storm, right? I want you to look up flood, flood map and uh, the county, and uh, you'll get to the, the county website and just click around for, we'll take like, I don't know, four or five minutes. You guys just click around and, and, and see what, see how you're thinking in terms of, uh, uh, what information you're getting before the storm. Okay, good, good. So, so that, that's the storm, but I'm all, but so that, that's good to so check that out. But I also want to know, uh, like if you didn't click on the red thing and you were just went to this website, say last week or last month, what would you, what, what would, how would you be set up for, for understanding the risk or, 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 being aware of what hazards might be, you know, at your generic house somewhere in that county. So does it make you feel like you totally know exactly what's going on and, and you have a good estimate of risk? Right. Yeah. So, so I'd say this is, and we're not, not trying to attack these county people or whatever, right? But just this is, I think this is very representative. This particular website is very, um, uh, m many county information resources are similar to this website, right? So th there's information there, right? There, there is stuff there, but
but you have to know how to interpret it, right? It's not, it's maybe not the easiest thing to pick up and read, right? Um, especially maybe if you uh, weren't, weren't uh, you know, didn't have a college background or didn't have a technical background, this might be a little bit harder to interpret, right? Is my house okay? I don't know, right? Maybe, maybe not. So, um, so this is a very non-trivial thing. And I'll, I'll have a note right here. So here we go, flood maps and zones. Anywhere it rains, it can flood. Everyone in the county is in a flood zone. Flood zones can be low, moderate, or high risk. Flood zones, evacuation zones, and storm surge are different. Okay, blah, blah. FEMA flood zones, known as flood insurance rate maps, show areas of high and moderate to low flood risk. High risks have a 1% chance or greater than like, uh, I don't know, blah, 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 right? If I'm, if I'm uh, Rando, if, I, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm my grandma, she's going to be like, okay, whatever, you know, like, so the, the, not really a call to action there, not really easily digestible stuff, 1% chance, I don't know what this is, whatever, okay. So that's, um, uh, so one, the county will say, and again, I'm not trying to pick on these guys, but, but, but the, the agency can say, oh no, we put information up for the public, yeah, no, no we, have, we have a public facing website, yeah, the stuff's all there, uh-huh, um, but uh, there, there isn't maybe that extra level to really go forth and do it. Now, there's many reasons for this. Uh, one of which is that, um, uh, you know, uh, climate change was not allowed to be talked about in most contexts in the state, for example, right? So, so if you're working at an agency and you want to talk about, oh, if, if we have a big, if we're having more hurricanes, it might be more flooded. That, that could trigger some people saying, oh, well, this, is pol this is political. What are you, what's going on? This is, no, 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 no. Let's just stick to the facts. Or, right? So there's, there's many reasons why we produce products like this. But, but suffice to say, this is, this is where, you know, if you were a resident here, I'm going to go to the county. I'm going to search flood map. You might find this. Okay. Um, next... Uh, let's look at this one. Let me, uh -huh. yeah, right, yeah. So this isn't like going into Orlando or something like that, but, but, um, but w for the parts that it shows, which is like sort of the main core area of Tampa, basically, um, why do you think this was, why is this method of engaging the public more effective than the last website we looked at? So this is more obvious. So, so there's obvious bad places, less bad places. And even if maybe you don't have a degree in GIS or something or, or whatever, you can sort of glance at it and it's a more intuitive, well, I mean, I, you guys tell me if I'm wrong, but it, it seems to me a more intuitive interface. Yeah? Okay. All right, cool. So, um, so one of the problems we have before storm, before we have the crisis, is are we able to communicate to the public? Do they understand the lay of the land? Do they understand, in this case, since we're talking about hurricanes, do they understand the potential vulnerability of their home, right? Most of us are gonna go with our historic uh, experience. So most of us are gonna say, oh, I drove on that, drive on that road to school every day. And so of course it's cool because I drive on the road to school every day, right? Um, and so if we don't have effective ways of, of communicating that, uh, that, let's say, the, the roadbed is being eroded slowly and that maybe it's actually not as safe as we think it might be, just because dr I've driven on it, you know, a, a hundred times, that doesn't mean it's maybe going to be drivable for another hundred times, right? That kind of thing. So that's really fundamental to um, a lot of our management challenges is making sure we are starting from a place where people... Um, generally can sort of uh, uh, understand that. So, that, so that, that's the communication and, and risk part. Okay, next is the link that I just, um, that, I, that I replied to that last one and I put another link in. So click on that and that'll take you to a web browser and that's gonna take you to um, uh, a series of historic images that will start to, after you, look on it for a minute or click on it for a second, it'll start to automatically advance and it'll just, it'll loop, it'll start going through time. So you can pick a spot or two in this area and 
uh, see what's going on. So in this case, the idea here is to try to uh, talk about how much development has gone on the last several decades in, in this area or, or the area you want to focus on. So let's you guys have a look at that. It can be a lot of information too. Right. Kind of slow with right. So it's sort of convenient for grandma in the sense that she doesn't have to push anything. It just sort of starts to kind of tick. So, so there's sort of an, an automatedness to this, which maybe she doesn't have to figure out the click in advance and everything. That's cool. But then, right, just like we're saying, it, it, um, it, that's cool. But maybe there's more complex data here, or maybe there would need to be a little more guidance to, to help, uh, help explain um, some of this visual info. Yeah? Agreed? Okay. 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 So then um, this, is, this is from a study from 20 years ago now, but here's another line of evidence that um, stuff is, or another reason why um, maybe uh, we need to think about risk here or, or think about a uh, different management approach. And so this was a GIS based approach um, looking at impervious surfaces. And so these folks uh, uh, looked at the previous few decades of change um, up to basically the start of the millennia. And they found that, at that by that point, and so we're talking about the, the watershed that uh, Tampa Bay sits at the mouth of. So Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay watershed. Um, by 2002, about 1,800 square kilometers were uh, at least, you know, by the pixel resolution they had at the time, at least 10% was impervious surface. Um, so, meaning there's a, a decent amount of concrete in that, that little pixel, that little chunk of data. And when you add that up, that's tw almost a third of the watershed had some significant amount of impervious surfaces on it, right? So that's, that's a challenge. Um, and, these, and, and that had increased three times in the decade before, right? So very rapid hardening of the landscape in this area of the world. And they estimated that if, if the current, traject current trajectory, uh, if they stayed on their current trajectory, that they were going to have something like another, uh, you know, at least 400 square kilometers by next year, right? So, uh, so we'll look and see. Uh, so so I, I, don't, I don't know if anybody's followed this up at the moment, but it's certainly possible to follow this up and see how well we tracked with that. My general feel is that we're actually exceeding that, but I'm not, I'm, I don't have the data. That's just a suspicion. That's just a hypothesis. But, um, but right, so we're rapidly converting the system. So when people talk about, oh, I'm going to make our management decisions for this part of the coastal zone based on my experience, because we haven't had a problem with past hurricanes, this is telling us that this, this system is fundamentally different than it was the last few, you know, decades, right? And so, so if you're basing your experience on what happened in the past, this is not that system from, from a couple decades ago. Okay. Uh, another, a really, really great tool, and in disasters, we spend more time and go into this, but we're not going to do that today, but, but um, a great uh, uh, group is this... Um, sort of started as a nonprofit, but really it's a company, it's called First Street. It's sort of a quasi nonprofit government. And they do um, very discrete level property, parcel level modeling of climate risk across the whole country. So really cool stuff. Um, and their uh, exploration of Tampa Bay recently found that the whole area would be cast, categorized as a major flood risk zone. And they found just in the primary uh, city area, uh, more than 55,000 properties that were very likely to flood in the next 30 years. And they did this, this was a couple years ago. Um, and that translates to something like almost half of the properties, right? So that's, that's a lot. That's a lot of, of parcels, a lot of ownership potentially vulnerable. So again, all these things maybe make it easier to have conversations with people or, 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 well, I would say easier. Sometimes people hear this and they get freaked out and they say they're scared. They don't want to talk about this. They want to bury their head in the sand. But, but if we want to have effective understanding and talk about the real risks, these types of information, this type of information is helpful, right? 
So this is not coming from the government, right? This is not coming from um, uh, a local university or whatever. This is coming from a for-profit company that does the whole country. So they don't have anything against Tampa. They don't have anything against Florida. They're just, this is, this is what we see the risk, economists and, and everybody, right? So, so this also has this um, sort of third partiness about it um, that is maybe useful. And then we have a um, story map you guys can look at. And so I'll talk about this and then maybe we'll take a, a break, let you guys hit the bathroom and then we'll come back and I'll, I'll, I'll share the link with you. But so in this, in this particular story map, um, uh, I'm zeroing in on the part here just around Tampa Bay, but this was uh, 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 put together uh, last year by um, uh, some folks that are trying to turn some of our, our STEM stuff, some of our natural science, our physical science estimates into some social science, some socioeconomic numbers. And so in this case, it is uh, uh, dollars. And so what these guys found was in these beach towns, in these beach towns, um, uh, they're going to lose w with, with sea level rise. And so this was specifically looking at sea level rise to 2100. So they're going to lose something like half of all their, their economic income from these beach towns because of uh, rising seas. And that's going to translate, translate into something like um, parts or in some cases whole chunks of these beach towns are going to be really wet. And by wet, we mean the monthly high tide. It's, they're going to be inundated for at least two weeks around, around that high tide. So it's, it's not just wet for an hour or two, but it's going to be wet for a long time. Statewide, that translates into the, the assessed value of the property. Not talking about the economic losses or anything like that, but just the, the, value, the current valuation of the property. Um, of those flooded parcels, that's going to be about $620 billion worth of stuff, worth of, worth of property. And that, that translates into about $2.36 billion in income tax for, local, for, for the, for the um, state or local government in these areas. So um, it's important to say that Florida does not have an income tax. And so it's even more important, their, their property taxes and this and that, because that's like the main way they, they sales taxes and property taxes are basically it, right? So if you're going to cut out one of the legs of those stools, you're going to have no money to maintain roads or, or streetlights or firemen or whatever the heck it is. Um, and that, and, and that, that translates into something like about a population, about 5 million people uh, currently uh, in these areas in Florida are going to be living where um, uh, more than 10% of the um, uh, uh, income is coming from uh, uh, those properties. So, so, the, so they're going to be, they're going to be hard hit. There's lots of different ways to, to slice and dice this. Okay. So uh, why don't you guys take a quick 10 minute break? And then I'll, I'll send out the link and you guys can come back and you can play with that story map for a minute or two before we keep going on. So, uh, like, for example, on the um, St. Petersburg metro area, the tab that I'm clicking on here. So, on the, uh, so for example, on the St. Petersburg metro tab here, um, it, uh, it has some auto advances. So, like we were talking about with the Google map earlier. Uh, it like you don't need to be um, in and, and, and tweaking dialogue boxes and optimizing values. It, it should, once you get to this part of the story map, it will automatically uh, you know rotate, scroll through the data or scroll through the model uh, uh, or the representation and stuff. So that's cool. Um, it's got a mixture of map based, geospatial based information and some text explaining stuff. Right. So. So if it did look too technical, you could, you could maybe look over at the words and that might be helpful. Um, cool. What might you guys do to make this stronger? Or, or brainstorm ideas that maybe you could make, that might be worth trying maybe.
Anybody? So you guys think it's a perfect product then? Well, that's good. That's good to know. You guys are easily, easily impressed. That's good. What's the audience for this? Uh, general public. Oh. Random Maybe citizens. It's not the best. Okay, why not the best? I feel like it's a little more what I see in like technical classes. Mm -hmm. We've used that for like flood cleaning. It's not, like that. it's not really like a. It's not intuitive. Have to really read it. Yeah, it can be. It's 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 a useful exercise to pretend that we've never seen something, which is sometimes hard because we like this kind of stuff we see all the time. But uh, it's maybe a useful exercise to take it to your barber or take it to your whoever friend down the street or something, and, and just show them and, and sort of see through their eyes. Do they does this make sense? Are they automatically click 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 jumping from tab to tab to tab? Or are they looking at it and kind of like, oh, what is this? Oh, how does this work? Right, that, that all tells you that maybe they need um, a little more orientation or explainer, you know, that kind of thing. Cool. What else? What are other thoughts about this product? It's wordy. It's what? Wordy. Wordy. Yeah, there was this cool project years ago, and I don't think anything ever came of it, but... Uh, Bill Gates bought this thing uh, that was uh, it was this Da Vinci code. It was this this old manuscript of Da Vinci's or something, and this was in the early days of of the web, and uh, and he said he was gonna have a build an interface. I mean, maybe he did. And I just never saw it, but but he was gonna build an interface for this that everybody anybody could read it. So the Italian person could read it. The English speaker could read it, the whatever. And, and his idea was to you have this like virtual magnifying glass that you would shine over the original text and it would translate it. And I always thought that would be cool, especially for like simplifying stuff, right? So you could write it in as technical as you want it to be, but it'd be really cool if we had like a wand, you could wand, you know, kind of like bring it over. And for folks that maybe are naive or don't know those, that terminology or whatever, it would do a, a, a little blurb. So you can do that now with um, with AI, making that easier. But I was thinking more of like a real real time instant instant translator. But um, but that would be nice. But that that's, that would always be nice to have something magical like that. Okay. Um, cool. Okay. So um, so yeah. So you guys played around with that for a little bit and and saw some. Uh, so I, I hope as we've kind of been going through these, these things are looking a little more sophisticated or a little more effective, maybe than the the you know the earlier versions. Um, but but again, still not not perfect, maybe. Okay, the next thing we need to talk about, um, which is a, a huge coastal. It's not just coastal management, but it, it seems to be most acute in the coastal zone is this whole craziness that's been evolving with insurance, right? One of the reasons we have, a couple of years ago, we introduced a question onto the survey about insurance was because this was starting to get, um, get crazy. So let's talk about, firstly, what insurance is supposed to do. So insurance is supposed to spread risk out, right? So that um, things that uh, uh, could derail us and were it to happen, and cause all kinds of problems, we would um, sort of hedge our bets against that. And so, so every year or every periodicity, we would sort of contribute some money, um, some amount of investment towards something. And then if we ever did need that, we would have um, be able to be made whole and we wouldn't be derailed, right? So if we had a, a bakery and then something and lightning struck our bakery, and you know if we didn't have any insurance, we might be screwed because maybe we don't we don't have maybe three hundred thousand dollars to repair the roof or or whatever the the cost is, right? So that's the basic idea, and for a long time that's how insurance has worked. So we have a shared pool, which are all the individuals being insured, and the person providing the insurance is uh, saying, okay, yeah, I got that. So so I know that you know probabilistically, you know, the, the odds are that, you know, one or two of you are going to have an accident in the next year. And so I got that. 
So I'm going to base my rates on these so-called actuarial tables, so on the, these, these probability distributions and probability tables, right? So, so your age, how, um, you know, how you tend to drive, and people of your demographic, um, you know, how frequently are they in accidents, and all that kind of stuff. We put it all together and go, okay, I think that enough people aren't going to be having accidents this year that I could charge X amount and that would cover me for a typical year when you know a handful of you guys would have accidents. And so all of us would be subsidizing the, the person who um, maybe experiences the bad luck, right? And then because it's a business, then the business is making some money on it. But, but that's the basic idea. Everybody with me on that? So things are, things are kind of changing in that realm. And so rather than seeing insurance now as a, a protector, a, a key thing that helps us with our you know, peace of mind and our, our, our you know, long-term planning and whatever, now oftentimes insurance is seen as the barrier, as, as an adversary, as something that's meant to be overcome. And back in the day, while no insurance company you know, ever quote unquote wants to pay money when there's, an, when there's a claim, it used to be much simpler. It used to be much simpler. And yes, there's always been fraud, and so they always want to make sure that people aren't you know, committing arson and intentionally burning their house down, stuff like that. But, but by and large, it was like, oh, okay, you had an accident, all right, yeah, clearly, you know, I, I see that this guy ran the red light and hit you or something like that, okay, I got it, and then you know, compensated. That is changing with regards to um, a lot of these coastal hazards. And so what's happening is now the insurance industry is kind of saying, uh, I don't think I want to insure you anymore, right? Not, hey, let me figure out the insurance risk pool and, and sort of adjust rates, but just I just think this is too crazy. I want to get out. Okay, so the other thing, to, just to make sure I say, because you guys are, uh, I don't want to make assumptions, but I'm assuming you guys are not homeowners. Uh, that's probably a safe assumption, I know. Um, but uh, so just so we're on the same page, how this works, how home ownership works in the U.S. is uh, I want to buy a home. And so I figure out, okay, I decide I want to buy this home. And the person tells me how much the home costs. And then usually I'm not financially independently wealthy, right? I'm not like a football player or a movie star or something. I don't have all this money in the bank. If I did, I just go to the bank and this person say, I say, how much is that? And they say, it's a million dollars. And I go, okay, write him or her a check for a million dollars and we'd be, we'd be good, basically, right? Instead, I need to get a loan, which we usually call a mortgage. So I need to get a mortgage. And so what's actually happening is I'm going to give some down payment, but all the rest of that million dollars that that person said they want to sell me their house for, all the rest of that million dollars, is going to, they're going to get their million dollars, but it's going to come from the bank. And so now I have a loan with the bank. So technically, I, it depends on how much you know, my, my down payment was, but I own some fraction of my house and the bank owns the rest. And over the course of the next several years, most typically it's either a 15-year mortgage or a 30-year mortgage for most, most places in the U.S. And that's, that's uh, when you work out the numbers, how many, how many years it's going to take you to pay off the loan. So at the end of that 15 years or the end of that 30 years, assuming you don't take out another mortgage, um, I'm going to be like, okay, so then, then I will own my house 100%. It'll be, it'll, uh, I own it, what's called fee title. I, I own the whole thing, right? So that's great. But in that, in that initial part, which is where most people are in the U.S., right? Most people have a mortgage. Uh, either they pay rent or they have a mortgage. So for that, for that, um, uh, that mortgage, and also a lot of times for you guys to get renter's insurance, um, there's going to be some requirements. So the bank's going to go, hey, yo, I own this. So essentially, I, the bank, me, the bank, I'm the owner, right? And so I'm worried about flooding or I'm worried about wildfire. So as part of my mortgage, I'm going to have a legal contract that says you must have insurance for whatever the risk that I deem is here, right? So that was not a problem back in the day when, when it was relatively easy to get insurance. As insurance starts to become harder and harder, it means 
that maybe I can't buy that house, even if I want to buy that house, because because maybe I want to buy it, and maybe the bank will give me a loan, but uh, I can't find someone to sell me the insurance, or sell me the insurance at a at a reasonable rate, or sell me insurance that will cover the full value of the house, in which case the bank will go, oh, I reject it. So what used to be a very boring, you know, snorefest aspect of home home ownership has now become this huge thing that's beginning to derail uh, uh, purchases. And so, and so we're seeing that in California, we're seeing that in Florida as well. So in Florida, it's become, it's become so hard to get insurance in a lot of these hurricane areas, these coastal hazard areas. Um, the state created their own thing called the Citizens Property Insurance Company. So the, the state government created their own company, right? Funny from the people that say that they don't want government in your lives. But anyway, uh, so they say, uh, hey, uh, yeah, so they created this thing. And it's essentially what we call uh, insurer of last resort. We have a similar type of thing here in California. Does anybody know what it's called for wildfire? It's called the FAIR plan. Same, same basic idea. Now, it's not the full coverage. Okay, also let me, since you guys probably don't know about insurance. So there's, um, there are different levels of insurance, right? In most cases, what we're talking about is when something that you didn't do, so, you know, a so-called act of God, a, a, a tornado strike or something like that, right? Hits my house and destroys my house. I want to be able to rebuild my house, Right? And so a lot of people do that. So a lot of people say, I want to rebuild my house. But they do it whenever they buy their house. So let's say we bought our house in 2000. So we're like, okay, yep, get my insurance. And, and how much does my, my house cost? My house costs this much money. Okay, cool. And then I want to rebuild it. Okay, and this is how much it would cost to, to rebuild it. Okay, cool. Um, one, we oftentimes don't keep up with that because every year it's going to get a little more expensive. The guy's charging. So, so we had a... a we had a, um, a uh, slab leak at my house. So in California, for some bizarre reasons, no one's ever been able to explain to me. We, we put pipes into con- our concrete slab, which is crazy. Right? Old houses aren't doing this, but new houses, they do this. And so uh, the guys that built the house like use all this cheap crap and everything, and it basically leaked. And so we discovered it when we saw water dripping out of the walls, essentially. And so luckily it was in a corner of the house. It wasn't in like, you know, the middle room kind of thing. It was on the corner of the house, but it happened in the pandemic. And so we caught it early, you know, fixed the stuff and whatever. But then we had to do the repair. So I got a, I got a, and, the, and my insurance company said, yep, it was, wasn't your fault. It was an accident, whatever, you know, blah, blah, blah. Here's how much it's going to cost repair. So go do it. And so I called up a, a, um, contractor and he came in, looked at it and said, okay, here's the price. I'm like, great. And then like the pandemic started rolling hardcore and he goes, oh yeah, by the way, it's going to be three times the cost. And I was like, whoa, 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 what dude? You said you gave a contract. He's like, yeah, sorry, bro. I'm like, wait, yeah, but, but you said that like, okay, then I guess I won't do the project for you. I'm like, no, no, no. So, so things always get more expensive, right? So, so usually when we get insurance, we want to re- rebuild our house. But just like we said, the infrastructure is a key part of this thinking and, and a key part of the, the hidden cost. So is building to current building codes. So maybe you're in, so let me know how old your house, the house you're living in now, anybody know, or apartment, or everybody know how, what year it was built? Um, I was living in a townhouse, I think it was built in 1971. 71, okay. Anybody else know? 54. 54? 1930? No, 30 years ago. Oh, 30 years ago. Okay, so like like uh, like 1990s kind of thing. Okay. Okay. So cool. So 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 it's it's so old places, right? And so they're fine now and they're cool. Those things have all been what we call grandfathered in. So grandfathering is is when we have a law or a policy about something, the way something is constructed, the way something is main, maintained, what have you. Um, and, uh, that if it was, if it was done now, we wouldn't allow it to happen. But of course we can't make everybody knock their houses down. So that term is grandfathering in. So, okay. So I'm going to let Victor stay in his house and keep doing his stuff. But 
if he wants to put in a new bathroom or, or if, he, if he's going to do something that's going to trigger the inspector or the regulator to come in, they're going to say, oh yeah, yo dude, you need to build to the, the current standard, right? So back in the day, they could have one wire through the wall. Now you have to have it grounded and all that kind of stuff, right? So that's also going to mean that it's not just about you putting up, in most cases, it's mostly not about you putting up another thing, a drywall. It's as you do some major repair, which is the kind of stuff that's going to happen in the wake of a hurricane or an earthquake or a wildfire, it's, gonna, it's, it's just going to be much more expensive than we think, right? And you have to build to current building codes. If you don't, um, it's going to be a problem. So for example, after Hurricane Katrina, we were, the first couple of years, we we're doing a lot of home recovery or, or, or uh, uh, demolition and then rebuilding. There was a huge debate. Should we hold, so at the time, the state of Louisiana, check this out, state of Louisiana had no building code. I'll say it again. There was no building code, no statewide building code, which sounds crazy, but it's true. So there were building codes maybe in a parish or there are building codes maybe in a city, but in this generic, and a lot of these rural uh, people that were impacted, their towns, their, their homes, they weren't in, a, in an incorporated area. So they weren't in one of those places. And so there's this huge debate. And so the feds wanted to give money to people in New Orleans, but they're like, hey, again, this also comes with this misinformation stuff and this don't trust people stuff, which is very problematic. They say, oh, all these people in Louisiana are going to cheat and steal. They're going to steal all the money. So we can't just give them money because they're all cheats, right? So we need to put some rules on this thing. We need to put some guidelines on this thing, right? And so there was a huge debate in the state legislature between, um, should we just give them the money? Should we just give Jason the money? Or should we make Jason jump through all these hoops to get the money? And so the ultimate thing they, they, they decided upon was, if you're doing de novo, in this case, Louisiana, they, they, the state passed new building codes. So now there are minimum, minimal building codes for the whole, for all the state of Louisiana that you have to build to this minimum standard. But, but um, if you were doing a rebuild, uh, 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 if you had at least one wall that was remaining, so that's a renovation, that's not, a, that's not considered de novo construction, you didn't have to follow those new building codes. So that was the compromise. So we were there, I remember one year we were in there with a bunch of you guys, a bunch of you know, undergrads, and we're doing stuff. And we, one year we gutted the whole place. And then that second year we're, we're adding stuff on and there was all this wiring. And so all of a sudden this one day this guy brings all this drywall. Boom, here's all this drywall. Boom. I'm like, okay. He's like, yeah, let's start hanging the drywall. And I was like, oh, don't you have to wait for the inspect electrical inspector to come and check and make sure all the wires legit, not going to cause a fire? He's like, oh, that's cool. I'm like, yeah, I trust you guys. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, I, not that I don't trust you, but it's like, uh, you know, you guys are great at sweeping up stuff, but I don't know if you're really, you know, a state approved electrical contractor. I'm like, maybe you want to have someone look at these things. And, and so it was this very kind of weird thing where we're like, I don't think we should seal up the walls because you should probably check our work. Um, anyway, um, so all of that though speaks to uh, the, the things being more expensive were we to build them to our current standards, right? Which we all like. We all like fire warnings and, and all that kind of stuff, but it comes at a greater cost. Okay. So these guys create this Citizens Property Insurance Corporation because so many insurers were leaving the state. They're like, ah, this is too expensive. We don't want to do business here. We're just going to bail on Florida, right? Again, um, if you are a homeowner that is trying to buy a house and you can't get insurance, you can't buy a house. So it's a, hu a huge societal knock on it. But then there's, then there's no tax base and there's all kinds, of, all kinds of problems. So they create this Citizens Property Insurance Corporation to sort of fill that gap. So it's not all the bells and whistles. It won't make you, it won't maybe make your, whole, your house whole, but you could maybe fix the roof kind of thing, right? So it's not, so it's way more expensive than the previous insurance and it's not, doesn't cover as much, but at least it is insurance, right? It's insurance. Okay. So now, um, now uh, we have this going on, but now the, the current politics are such that people are like, we shouldn't be doing insurance. So 
what's just happened in the lead up to these twin hurricanes is uh, that the state has decided we need, we're going to start pushing people off of this insurer of last resort. Because these new insurers have come into the state and they said that they'll take care of them. So that's good. So then I don't want, I don't, we don't want to give you the state insurance anymore. So um, there's about 400,000 people um, kicked off the rolls starting in August. And then by the end of this month, there's going to be another about 200,000. So it's roughly 600,000 people are now being moved from the state insurer of last resort to the, um, to the uh, 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 new private insurance market. Uh, so far, so far, this citizen's property insurance, this is still early days, right? They've gotten somewhere around 85,000 claims from Helene, just, just Helene, right? And I'm sure it's going to go up in the next many weeks. And then with this other hurricane, it's going to go more. So there was a ton of claims being put on this uh, uh, insurer that's underwritten by the state. Um, for, uh, for this month, so bank rate, which is a... a company that, that estimates uh, rates for mortgages and stuff like that. Um, for a $300,000 home in Florida, uh, people are paying on average five th about $5,500 for insurance, which is a lot, which is a lot. Um, nationwide, the average for a $300,000 house is about $2,000, right? And then depending on where we are, it might be a lot more. It might be eight, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, depending on on where we're, if, if we're like right next to the water or something like that. Um, and so that's why that video I played last week, I'll, I'll share it again with you, or I'll, when we take a break, I'll, I'll, I'll play it for you. That's why the gentleman talks about being self-insured, right? Self-insured. So that means that he doesn't have a bank loan or they don't have a bank loan and they're just not, don't have any insurance, right? Or they, or they have liability insurance if somebody trips and falls on their, on their, uh, front doorstep, but they don't have natural damage, uh, you know, recovery insurance type stuff. So a huge challenge. Um, so it's now becoming clear that with all these recent gutting of the insurance industry in Florida and the vacating there, and then the bad actors that remain, most of these, many of these smaller companies that remain are not well capitalized. They don't have bazillion million dollars billion dollars to pay off people. And so they basically drag their feet. And so when you have a real claim, they just go, oh yeah, we're not going to pay it. Or we're going to give you like $3,000 or something like that, right? And knowing full well that if they get dragged to court, they have to pay, but they're just hoping that most people won't do that. So they'll just pocket the money. So there's a lot of dysfunction in this industry. Um, and so, uh, and so, yeah, a lot of these people, when you hear story after story, in the last week or so, and I, unfortunately, I think we're going to hear more of this after you know tomorrow. It's going to be the same thing. I don't have any money. I don't know what to do. I don't have anywhere to go. Um, and then we have. Uh, wait a second. Is that what I want to talk about next? I thought I wanted to talk about. Yeah, hold on. Let me go here next. Okay. So all these things are coming together. Again, it's not one element of the, the natural, uh, the ecology of the system or the physics of the system that's important, but other things are going on. So here's the whole US and, and the hotness here signals property that are most at risk for a natural disaster, okay? So, you know, we're, we're fairly warm in California, but uh, not as warm as say, say the Midwest, not as warm as the Gulf Coast, right? So this is what the risk is. This is where what people pay on, on average per property, you know, for, for, for the same, same valuation of property. We are very low relative to our risk. So is Florida relatively low compared to its risk. It's really only these folks in kind of the Midwest, by and large, that are that are paying, um, uh, you know, closer to matching what their risk is. Um, and so why might that be? Why are we, even though we have all our wildfires and stuff, why are we light blue here or teal? The what? Taxes or like Not taxes. Uh, uh, I forget what you said the state uh, insurance 
should right. Make it. Right. It's a state. It's a it's a state law that we said that insurers can only raise their rate a certain percentage, and so we capped how much um, we we capped the growth rate of of insurance rates, um, thinking that that would help people. In reality, what it's done is it started to drive insurers out of our state because people are saying, "Oh, I can't I can't charge what I want to charge for for the risk." Okay, and the same with Florida. Florida is also artificially low. Um, and so that, that, that creates, that policy decision creates distortions. Um, and so, uh, this is how much uh, companies were making profit on home ownership in the last couple of years in California and in Florida. And so if it's a, if it's 100%, they're breaking even. If it's above 100%, they're making money, right? Uh, okay, good. So, so you know, whatever this is, 2013 made some money, 14 made some money, da, 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 da. And then we hit this sort of 2017, 2018, the big wildfires, Thomas Fire, Woolsey Fire, that era. And whoa, they made, there's a lot of claims. Interestingly, though, that wasn't uh, dumb Californians and don't they know how to manage their fire? Because over here in Florida, from hurricanes, in roughly the same time period, same thing happened, right? Went from companies making money, making money, make, and this, this is for home insurance, making money, making, making, making money, and then all of a sudden, ugh, they're losing money. And so when this happens, right, a lot of the companies start to say, maybe we shouldn't do business here, or, or maybe this isn't doing work. Um, this is going on across the planet, right? So climate-driven disasters are growing. And so this is the number of, of really large uh, natural disaster related events uh, and, and the cost. So the, the exact amount doesn't matter. It's just as we go through time, we can see there's spikes and dips, but overall we're on this upward trajectory. So things are only getting more expensive, right? So things are getting only getting more costly. Um, yeah, okay, we can skip that. Um, and then, the, so the, the other thing you guys should know about insurance is that there's you and me, and we buy it from our insurance company, and then our insurance company buys insurance. Those are called a reinsurer. A, a reinsurer. Let me be more clear what I'm saying. A reinsurer. Okay? Like Swiss, Swiss Ray, and there's, there's a handful of them. Um, and so, they're, so they only write policies to insurance companies, right? And so this is, uh, this is essentially the rate that those reinsurers are charging to the insurance companies. And so we can see there's, there's you know, and this goes back to 1990. So we can see that, you know, some years are more expensive than others. Um, but, but overall, again, we're on this upward slant. So overall, we're, we're increasing as we go through time for the insurance companies. Yeah. Yeah, right. So this is, uh, so I think all these figures I've shown you are for us, um, uh, the same year. So, so this, this accounts for a CPI and all that kind of stuff. Um, but you're right. In general, just sort of seeing the raw numbers, we don't know, oh, hey, was this, was this $1988 or is this $2024? All the stuff I'm showing you are, the same, are, are standardized by the same year. Um, but it is something to watch out for. That's good. That's good. Okay, and, and so we know, like this example from Lahaina, right? We know that these, these not only are they just sort of more fires, but, but we're having these more episodic events that, that when they come in, it's a huge deal, right? And it's not just needing to pay for a couple properties or a couple things, but it really has massive, you know, systemic changes to the economy, systemic changes to the society, to the education system, to all that kind of stuff. Um, and so... Uh, let's look at what's going on here with State Farm. State Farm is the largest home insurer in the U.S. Largest in California, definitely. Largest in the U.S. And so this is State Farm's data. So State Farm is, is not technically traded on the stock market. So you can't, there is, there's, a, there's not what we call a um, market capitalization. It's, a, it's a, a thing that's owned by the shareholders, uh, by, owned by the um, 
whatever you call it, the, the um, people that have insurance. Uh, so, okay, so there's two things here. So there, this is auto, this is cars, your car insurance, the blue guy, and the peach guy is home, which is what we're sort of talking about here, right? And so this is, so this is this, um, uh, what, what's called uh, uh, loss ratios. So all you need to know is 100% is they're breaking even. 100% they're breaking even. Um, down here, they're making money. And insurance companies would like to be in the 40 to 60% range of this proportional measure. It doesn't, doesn't, they specifically don't matter, but just like this is what they want to be, right? So that they're, they're making a good amount of money and they're not losing a huge amount of money. So as we get closer to this 100, they're getting closer to, to making as much as they, uh, they're paying out as much as they bring in, right? And so note that we've had some pro times, 2000 in the wake of 9-11, it sort of spikes up and then it kind of dies down. And there's, there's always kind of some up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Uh, and right now we're in what appears to be an up. I think the most recent is for the part of this year, 2024, is it's also kind of going up another couple percentage. So it sort of seems to be sort of staying up around here. So, um, so this, is, this is what it is, but, but as of right now, what's happening is the insurance companies are saying, is this really worth it, right? Is it really worth it? Is it that, that, that marge, small marginal profit, is that, is that worth me being in it? Again, back in the day, people that were in the insurance industry were kind of like, yo, I'm part of the community. Like I do an important service. Yeah, I make money, but, but I also like, I enable businesses and people to have homes and stuff like that. That seems to be shifting. <laughs> That doesn't seem to be as huge a concern for the insurance industry now. It seems to mostly be about, uh, am I making money, right? Which isn't bad. It's not bad to make money, but, but um, it, some of the other societal social contract stuff seems to maybe be changing. And so if this is the only thing that we're looking at, that doesn't bode well for people having homeowners insurance. Okay. And then lastly, uh, looking back in... And in, in the Florida example, this is um, uh, how, much, how much costs are. And this is relative to flood risk, relative to flood risk for our hurricanes coming in. And so uh, this is how much people are paying all these different years. And it's kind of going up and down. And people that are not in a particularly risky area for hurricane damage, it, yeah, it's, I guess it's gone up a bit, but it's not really gone up a huge amount, right? It's kind of like up, down, up, down. And the lower risk, uh, sort of. And the medium risk is uh, the higher risk. Uh, but the highest risk, and these are the folks that are right there, like in Tampa Bay, on the water in Tampa Bay and stuff like that, that are about to get whacked again by this next storm. Their rates are clearly going up much faster than other places. Um, and so, so this is starting to shake out in different ways and shapes and forms. Okay, the last thing I want to mention about this, sorry, I'm out of order, uh, is this, which is the, this, this last aspect of these dual disasters and disasters on top of each other is this aspect of disinformation and actively lying to you, actively pushing out baloney. Not, not, not I thought I heard something from my cousin and repeating it, which is a problem as well, but people actively pushing what they what is clearly false information. So last week in uh, Georgia, here we'll just place. North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, Virginia, Alabama, and Tennessee. That's our big one. And the devastation wrought by the storm is uh, incredible. It's, it's so extensive, nobody thought this would be uh, happening, especially now it's so late in the season for the hurricanes. No. Every time we have one of these major disasters, there's some politician stands up and they say things that are just total baloney and not true. We're not late in the season. The hurricane season goes to the end of November, right? That last hurricane struck in September. Just to be clear, September is not November. Um, and this is also peak season. So it's not too late in the season. No one could have ever predicted. Yes, you guys just looked at some, some uh, models, for example, some story maps from previous years that people looked at, oh, flood risk. So the notion that no one could have known is just not factually true. But that's usually how it starts. It usually starts with someone saying, 
um, uh, for po a political reason or some personal gain or whatever. Oh, we didn't know X would happen. We didn't know the tsunami would come. Nobody, nobody had any idea this was a tsunami zone. That kind of stuff, right? Okay, and then it just gets worse and worse. What's been happening now in the last few weeks, what's new is the addition of AI-generated fake stuff, right? And so that's what's going on here. This lady clutching a Bible, this is not real. This is all fake uh, generated. But it gets injected into social media immediately and starts being pushed out by everyone. So this got a lot of traction. This little girl is not a real girl, is not a real dog, is not a real situation. But it's tweeted out by the senator, U.S. senator, um, saying, help me caption this photo, right? And then when people point out that, hey, it's not real, the answer is, well, it should be. So we're just going to pretend it's real, right? So we all make mistakes. And in a, particularly in a disaster like this, I totally get it. It's very easy to make a misstep or make a, or whatever. But if someone points out that, ah, this is not the right data. You're, you're plotting last year's temperature data, not this year, Dr. A. Oh, geez. Okay, thanks. Let me, let me fix that, right? We need to fix it. We need to own up when we've misstepped. But what seems to be happening now, because we're in a presidential election and we have all this AI and we have all this hatred of one another and this distrust of one another, that everybody just seems to want, want to go, you know, full bore. And, uh, and so the, the, this picture is still circulating all around. In addition, people are saying active, not truth. So for example, um, uh, candidate Trump said, uh, talking about the response uh, last week, they've left Americans to drown in North Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, and elsewhere in the South under this administration, Americans always come last. And don't like the reports that I'm getting about the federal government and the Democratic governor of the state going out of their way not to help Republican areas. The re Republican and Democratic leaders have said, no, no, that's not true. It, we are getting assistance. We are getting aid. It doesn't stop, though. So that is not stopping the baloney. It's not stopping. It's, it's not as if someone misspoke and then they're being corrected. This, this fire hose of disinformation is coming at you uh, full bore. And so um, when the, the, one of these false... False pictures was was mentioned uh, this weekend to an individual to to someone that had been posting it. In this case, this is this um, uh, uh, Republican National Committee member. Um, uh, she said, "Oh, our government has failed us again." And then the comments were, "Oh, no, no, this is not a real this is not a real story. This is not a real image." Just so you know, this was made by AI. She said, y'all, I don't know where this photo came from. And honestly, it doesn't matter. There are people going through much worse than what is shown in this pic. So I'm leaving it because it's emblematic of the trauma and pain people are living through right now. That is incredibly dangerous, I would suggest, that um, for anybody to be doing this, particularly in a disaster when it's hard to get clear crystal information, to be told that what your info is is wrong and then say, I don't care, that's, that's a problem. That, that's a real problem. And, that, and that's spinning up in the wake of these twin disasters. So, uh, so that's where we are in terms of uh, uh, stuff. And I also will just say that um, that citizen's property, that, that state-created insurer, is now the 10th largest insurer by premiums written in the U.S., so it's a large number of folks that are, are on that fallback plan. Um, and, you know, again, it's not just a, a random handful of people in a couple counties or something like that. So it's a, it's a real challenge. So again, the, the thing you guys should be thinking of is, have we become too complex to manage? I'm not saying we have been, but, but, but when we have these crises back to back, it, it um, is, is a challenge. You can come in, Zach. Uh, so... So that's what we're talking about. Let's see where we are. Um, let's see where we are right at the moment.